mentioned the idea of corporate culture and reputation being uh, mm -hmm. linked. I guess I wanted to talk to you, follow up on that by asking you to talk a little bit about how, <clears throat> what are the ethical uh, considerations that you keep in mind when you're thinking about communicating to the folks inside mm -hmm. and to the external mm -hmm. stakeholders? Mm -hmm. Communicating inside and outside, I think you have to use the same principles and guidelines because the line of demarcation between a workplace and a marketplace is now blurred because largely of the internet. So what we send internally and how we communicate internally and how we inspire our folks internally has to meet a litmus test of someone on the outside seeing that and making a judgment call uh, on that. Ethical challenges. Has new media and social media changed the ethical challenges you face or exacerbated them? Uh, simply um, taken the same old ethical challenges and just made them much more intense? Yeah. Or are they different now? Well, for FedEx, I don't think social media has changed the ethical standards uh, at all because uh, we've always, I think, been incredibly ethical and buttoned up with respect to governance. I think. What it has done, though, is it uh, has made us much more alert on engaging and engaging very quickly um, to speak up when there is some, you know, story out there or some rumor uh, that's not true and defending uh, ourselves. I do think, though, it has had an impact on some companies that may have not had the uh, standard of governance and ethics that they should have because now people can understand and know and research more about that company and apply pressure um, in that regard. Where I see some of the challenges sort of proliferating for corporate communications people in this regard is, is that the same standards of ethics and protocol that used to exist and still exist in the traditional media, let's say like editorial quality, it's kind of a mishmash out there. There are some people who masquerade as journalists or bloggers on the internet, but in fact, they do not apply the same level of quality or fairness to their storytelling. And they can quickly create communities based on rumors or misperceptions against you. And, and so, and we had one specific example, let me share with you, if I think, which I think that brings this to life, and that is, Someone called, it was a, one of these internet journalists, and they said, uh, you know, we're writing a story, and uh, we'd like your point of view on the story. Of course, we, we took offense to the story. We did not think the facts were correct, so we gave them some facts and our, our statement. Well, the story runs. We're nowhere to be found in the story. There's an uprising in a certain part of the U.S. within this social community. Of course, we're unfairly represented. We're feeling the pressure from this community. So you look at that situation and you say, what happened? So we called the person up and they had the gall and audacity to say, oh, you know, I really didn't think that your points really fit my story, so I chose not to include the company's statements in the story. Now, we eventually got over the hump and cleared our good name. It was not easy, but those are the kind of things that happen. I think people rush to get something out because they're paid by word or paragraphs or length of stories. So I think quality has degraded, has been degraded here in this new wild, wild west. I think people rush to judgments. They're too quick to hit the button without trying to find objectivity and fairness in what they're saying. And I do think that it has had an amazing influence on the political space. Um, I think one of the reasons we have gridlock now in Washington is because our politicians are more worried about the real-time soundbite and their you know, constituencies and what they're hearing on various biased networks that are out there rather than focusing on the business of America. Whereas in the old days, they would certainly do that they would debate, they would certainly use the news media, uh, at the time much smaller of course, but they had a lot more time to focus on consensus building and getting the job done. But now, if you're consumed by 
the message of the minute or the sort of, I don't know, show of the hour, whether it's traditional broadcast or online, you're not focusing enough on getting results, getting consensus. So they've become almost obsessed with the media machinery as we know it today and making sure they're not missing a beat. Uh, so I could be wrong. That's just my point of view. I didn't mean to get into that sort of political avenue here, but uh, it is a phenomenon of social media. And you did say earlier and made a good, very good case that the two are related. Yes. Uh, political, cor right. corporate culture. Yeah. Do you, a lot of what you mentioned, I think, is uh, you could use the word ethics to, <clears throat> to think about some of these yeah. qualities. And I guess my question for you is uh, a strong ethical compass, can that be taught or is that innate, do you think? I think a strong ethical compass goes back to your upbringing. Uh, I don't know if it can be taught. Uh, and that's just my personal view. I think it really is part of your value system. Uh, I think people can certainly make changes along the way. Uh, and those that do, I have seen use a tremendous amount of discipline to do that and to change. Um, but it's really, I, I believe, goes deep into the roots of your upbringing. So it makes that hiring decision even that much more important. Yes, I think you have to dig deep in the interview process to really understand what makes a person's moral compass tick.